Please consider coming back. Uh, for those who are here, they can see under the new guidelines here in Delaware, we're open to have uh, our meetings and you don't have to wear a mask if you've been vaccinated. And so we would encourage those at home to feel free to start returning. We do have the social distancing of having the ropes down the center of each aisle so that you can sit on the ends of each aisle. So we would encourage those who are watching online, consider coming back and joining us and your fellow members in fellowship. A few announcements for us to, uh, to take note of. The first one is on Sabbath, June 26, we'll have a baptism for Luke Williams and note it's going to be down at Dewey Beach in the Tower Beach area on the Bay Side. And so those of you who can join us there as the church, as we support Luke in this important decision. He just graduated uh, from Cape Henlopen High School this past weekend, and is, we're looking so forward to having Luke uh, join the church through baptism. And we would invite you, if you can, to uh, be present to support him at that time. Also coming up on June 27, we have the Healing Music Concert Tour of Jaime Jorge, or Jamie George as some say, and uh, we would encourage you to bring your friends and come and enjoy the beautiful music that he provides through his violin and his witness. Also upcoming, we have the Flag Cap coming up here in June 21st to the 25th. So we need you uh, to come for that. And at this time, we have Brianna who is going to make a special announcement about and presentation about Vacation Bible School. Brianna. Could you change the slide, please? adventure ever? Next summer, Group VBS is taking kids on a ride they'll never forget. Get on board the Rocky Railway. Your church will be on track at Sing and Play Express. With Jesus to lead us, we're on the right track. Get ready for high energy fun at Locomotion Games. Experience impactful Bible lessons and Bible adventures. You'll have amazing discoveries at Imagination Station. Take a glimpse into the world of five awesome kids who learned that Jesus' power pulls us through. The best part of summer is full steam ahead at Rocky Railway. Yeah, these guys think it's fun. Anybody else out there think it looks fun? Yeah? All right. So we are very excited because guess what? Registration is officially open. Parents, you can find it on Facebook, on the Dover First Facebook page. There is an event for Rocky Railway VBS, and you will find the link to register your children there. Please go on and register if you plan on coming. And 
If you are interested in volunteering or you're a parent that plans to be here with your child for the whole time and you're interested in helping out, go ahead and sign up on the volunteer paper that's in the lobby today. Or if you don't have a child but you want to help with this kid's ministry, we would love to have your help. So we look forward to it coming up in July, and we just ask that you pray for us. If you're not going to be here to volunteer, pray for the volunteers, pray for the children, and for the community that will be here. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna, and I hope all of the kids in the church will be here. Invite your friends and uh, around you to come as well. And also, I do want to remind each of you, that uh, because of the COVID-19, we're not passing the offering plate as usual, but in the, in the foyer, we do have a, a plate where you can drop off your tithe and offerings. For those of you who are watching online, please feel free to, to go to Adventist Giving. You can download the app and put it on your phone, or you can do it on your computer from home and pay your uh, contributions of tithe and offering online through Adventist Giving. At this time, we're ready to start our worship uh, with the praise team. But before we do, let's have a brief word of prayer. Oh, Lord, today we thank you for your blessings and this opportunity we have to come and worship you. I pray, Lord, that you will bless us during this service, that we will uplift you, and that those who are present and those watching online will be drawn closer to you my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church, as well as anybody watching on Facebook Live. We're glad that everybody's here this morning praising God's name, and we're going to begin by singing Blessed Assurance. Also, hymn number 462 in the hymnals in the piece. Whisper 
lovers of love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Raising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I am my Savior. Am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting. Looking up. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. So, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me So No 
my shadow, you won't light up Nothing, you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down That you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow, you won't light up Mountain, you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Light you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Light you won't tear down Coming after me Let's all stand for our opening hymn this morning, Come Thou Fount, hymn number 334. Come Thou Fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of Please be seated. Uh, just one brief comment that I failed to mention. We're blessed today to have elderly Eli Rojas, our ministerial director from the conference, who will be our speaker today. But he's also going to provide our special music in a few minutes. So we will be doubly blessed today. I'm glad you're here with us, Elder Rojas. If you're able to kneel, I invite you to kneel as we seek the Lord in prayer. O oh, gracious, good, and loving God, on this Sabbath morning we come to you, thanking you for the gift 
of your Sabbath. This opportunity we have to draw aside from the busyness of the world and to worship with you. I pray, Lord, that you will be with us in this service. And Lord, those who are watching online, bless them as well. We pray that you will be with them wherever they may be as well. Lord, today we want to lift up those members of our church who may not be here, but due to illness and health conditions, I pray, Lord, that you will be with each one of them. Show them your love and your care, and we pray, Lord, for your healing in each of their lives according to your will. And Lord, we ask and pray also that you will be with Elder Rojas as he brings our message today, Lord. Anoint his lips with the coal from your altar that his message may bring us closer to you. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for each of us. Be with us today in this service is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, oops, sorry about your hat. I have a question. Why are all these hats everywhere? And what is the loud noise? And why is that ugly hat on a stick? <gasps> well, technically, that was one, two, three. That was a whole bunch of questions. You're good at math. Try answering my question. <gasps> Which one? Try all of them. Okay, let's see. Um, well, what's happening is that we're having a parade. All these hats all over the place is my awesome hat collection. The noise is all the wonderful people who are watching the parade. And that is not, I repeat, that is not an ugly hat. That is a gorgeous hat. Thank you very much. That is my special rainbow bow hat. <laughs> what were you laughing at? Yeah, I messed up. It's actually my bow ranger hat. Bow ranger hat, huh? Yes, bow ranger hat. The only one of it in its kind, especially around these parts. I shall have you know Nice, I guess. Very purple, isn't it? The color is Emperor Rainbow. I shall have you know. Emperor Rainbow, huh? I almost thought it was purple. Huh. To the unchained eye, it might look purple. But for those of us who are more, um, 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 <laughs> hat conscious, we know better. Okay. And what is the reason for the parade? Huh. It's for my Emperor Rainbow hat. Uh, okay, let me get this straight. The parade is happening because of a purple... Emperor Rainbow. Right, an Emperor Rainbow hat. Since when do you organize a parade because of a hat? Huh. Not just any old hat. This is my hat. And it was lost. It, I was like going crazy. But, you know, I, I was like really worried and I had no idea where it was. And now I found it. So it's just natural that we would have a parade to celebrate. I don't quite get this. You lose one hat, not a big deal. You must have a gazillion of hats here. Um, actually, it's 100 exactly. Well, when the Emperor Rainbow hat is here. I get it. The Emperor Rainbow hat is more special than your other hats. Well, duh. Of course the Emperor Rainbow hat is special. But every one of my hats is just as special as any other. So what did you do when you found out it was missing? What could I do? I, 
I dropped everything and went looking for my hat that was lost. So you took the other 99 hats with you when you went looking? No. I left the other 99 and I went looking for my lost hat. Jeez, do you not know nothing about finding lost hats? And when you found your lost hat? Huh. Well, I found this nice long stick and then I put the hat on the very tippy top of the stick. And then I went running all over town screaming, I found my hat! I found my hat! I found my hat! Running all over town screaming with the hat on the end of a stick. Did people stare at you? Oh yeah, because I was like jumping and screaming. And yeah, of course they stared at me. You know, and, and I was shouting and, that I had found my hat, but people were clapping and they were happy with me. They were almost as excited as I was. One guy even said, wow, now they're the guy who loves his hats. So I invited everyone to come and join the parade to celebrate my found hat. You know, I gotta agree with you. You're a man who loves his hats. Maybe I can learn something from you. Here's your hat. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. It's so good to be with you folks. As, as uh, Pastor Green just told, uh, uh, told you, I am the uh, short director of Chesapeake Conference. And I was here just a few days ago uh, when we did the installation for Pastor Javier and his family. So I'm glad and I had the blessing of being able to come back soon. I'll tell you a little more about it in just a little bit. But there, there are a couple of songs in the Bible that if you look at them, and uh, I'm sorry, not, did I say the Bible? In the hymnal. In the hymnal. In fact, they are 337 and 338. They're next to each other. I don't know if you have to flip the page to see them or there, or if you open it, they're right there. But if you notice, they both start with the first stance and then the choir or the refrain, and they are the same. But they don't sound the same. In fact, they're in different keys. It's my wife's and I's favorite songs. And we sing it all the time. So I thought about sharing that with you. One of the things about playing special music is that if folks don't know what the words are, eh, it sounds okay, but it doesn't bring anything to mind. But this song reminds us that we are redeemed. How many of you are happy to be redeemed? How many of you know what it means to be redeemed? <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. That means that Jesus died for us, he paid for our sins, and then, as it says right here, redeem how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by... The blood of the Lamb is because of Jesus that we have the hope of eternal life. Amen? Amen. So, um, for those young people that don't know what this is, this is an accordion. And I hope that, that you all enjoy it. And I hope that all of you go, go home and say, Mom, Dad, I want an accordion. So you can learn to play the accordion, okay? <laughs> So I'm going to start with 
Amen. Praise the Lord. So you ask your mom for an accordion, okay? <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> well, <clears throat> go in here. There you go. All set. All right. Well, as I mentioned, uh, Pastor uh, Javier, well, no, I didn't mention that. So Pastor Javier called me this week and um, asked me if we could help him in the sense that he needed someone to cover for uh, the uh, pulpit this morning here in, in the church. Uh, because he has a funeral, and I don't know how many of you have heard of it, maybe some of you are aware of it, but he had to take care of a uh, funeral, uh, something with one of our church members in the family, and members of the church family. I'm not sure exactly how it was. The bottom line was I, I told him I would try to help find someone, because I was supposed to be in camp meetings. I, did you know that we're having camp meeting, right? And, and actually this weekend, as every year, this weekend is the Spanish camp meeting, and then starting on um, Monday evening, Tuesday evening, is the English camp meeting. So starting on Tuesday, we're going to have the English camp meeting. And folks online right now, and you folks are here in the church, I hope that you make time to see it. We're going to have everything we do for camp meeting, we're going to do it virtual. So there's going to be a programming for the children. There's going to be programming for the adults. There are going to be seminars. All kinds of activities. And if you want to know more about it, just go to the conference website and you'll see all that is going on. Now, next Sabbath, as it is this Sabbath in Spanish, next Sabbath in English, the program is going to be live. Still virtual. I mean, we're not going to have any audience, but we're going to do it in person and we will have the opportunity of interacting. So I'm sure people make comments and, and Facebook or whatever the different medias are going to be uh, available. And so we're looking forward to that experience. I'm sure it's going to be special. And how many of you are ready to do it in person? I know I am. So let's pray that next year everything will be in person. And, and of course, those that are not able to attend will be able to enjoy it in virtual uh, format. But we still are excited to and looking forward to the day when we can, can just get together and enjoy it. So, so as I was praying and thinking about this Sabbath, I thought about sharing something that I do very often because I am also Family Ministries Director for the conference. So I work with doing seminars and events and, um, and that have to do for marriage and home and enrichment. And so this morning I thought, well, it would be a great opportunity if I can share one of my seminars this morning, a seminar sermon, because it's, it's a sermon, but it's also in the context of a seminar. Now, I want to tell you something, because right away, someone's going to see the word right there, marriage. And if you're not married, you're going to think, well, this is not for me, right? I mean, that's usually what happens. But I want to tell you that there are principles here that you can apply to your life. So if you are single, you can learn about relationships, amen? And we need to learn about relationships. If you are married, well, I hope that you can apply this. If you have children, you're going to learn some key principles that will help you relate better to your children. So I hope and I pray that as we go through this presentation this morning, that each one of you will be able to take something home with you that will help you make a difference in your relationships. And, and if you're married in a particular way, that it will help you in your relationship. Now, this morning, is the presentation is entitled Intentional Marriage. And I come to this seminar in this, this title in particular because I've learned that many, many people, and I want to say the majority of individuals that get married, they plan everything up to the honeymoon. And then, that's it. No more planning. The rest happens more by accident than by intentionality. And I think that that's one of the many reasons, not the only one, but one of the many reasons why we sometimes struggle in our marriages. And it's because we don't act intentional when it comes to our marriage. And that is so important that we are intentional. In fact, this uh, presentation is part of a series where I talk about intentional marriage, intentional home, and I also talk about intentionality with your children. And it's because we need to be more intentional about what we're doing with 
our lives, our families, and our relationships. I love this one. I start with this one because this is a young lady that had all her plans laid out very perfectly in her life. She is a young lady, is a, a young boy is, is in love with her. You know the story when you are five, six years old. This seems probably around six or seven because of the handwriting. But this guy, this young man, writes to her and says, Dear Ashley, would you please be my girlfriend? I like, to, I like you a lot. And he says, you know, write yes, circle yes, no, or maybe. Well, you can see her answer. She says... She circles no, then she says, oh, this is the P.S. from him. He says, please, put yes or no, or maybe. And she says, I am sorry, I already have a boyfriend. His name apparently is Kyle. But when we break up, you're my next one. <laughs> you're my next choice. Now, I love the P.S. She says, P.S., that will probably be a month or two. Talk about being intentional, right? She had a plan. Nobody was going to mess with it. And she had her dogs in a row or her boyfriends in a row, maybe. I don't know. But it's, it's just funny. <clears throat> I, I caught this from, from Pastor Dr. Consuegra, who I know you guys know very well. So, so he talked about caring love. And notice what he said. He says, it represents a decision to care for your spouse, to do what you can to make your spouse happy. But I don't want you to miss this very important part. He says, it represents a what? What is the word right there? First yellow word? Decision. It is a decision that is made. It is not, doesn't happen by accident, by happenstance, by coincidence, or even by training. Even if you have gone to school and, and have gotten uh, licenses and degrees on, on marriage and family, etc., etc. I have seen some individuals that get those studies, those those, um, th that education, and they still struggle. I, they still struggle. I remember I was talking to a couple. I do a lot of marriage counseling, and this one couple in particular uh, was actually breaking up. And there was no way to help them. They had gotten to a place where they can be helped. And I was talking to him, uh, coincidentally, a few days later, trying to help them figure out what was going on. He tells me, I have a master's in marriage. Uh, in marriage. Um, I think it's marriage and something else. Anyway, I said, well, wait a second, you have a... I said, so did you see the signs? And the thing is, my friends, is that it doesn't matter what you have. You need to be intentional about what you're doing with your life. And that happens in every level. So this morning, I want to tell you that intentional marriage has to have several areas of intentionality. And I want to propose to you that the first one where marriage has to be intentional is your relationship individually and as a couple with God. Now, I do, as I mentioned, I, I do this often. I talk to a lot of couples and I've learned this. And this is the one of the reasons when people come to talk to me, I, I tell them, look, I am a pastoral marriage counselor. They tell me, well, what, what do you mean by that? Number one is I haven't gone to school. I don't have all the specialization that an expert psychologist may have. Number one. Number two is that I've known that you need God in the relationship. I didn't hear any amens. I'm going to say it one more time. You need to have God in that relationship. Oh, by the way, sound system folks must be going crazy with me. Let me change this. I need to, I'm going to switch this thing on, okay? Here we go. I made it. Maybe I just leave it off. Ready? Okay. All right, here we go. Now? Is that better? Okay. Good. I can walk away? All right, thank you. Appreciate that. <clears throat> and so, so it's very important. I've learned that individuals who make a decision to be faithful to God are going to do better in their marriages. But now, there's a trick here. Both have to make that decision. Anyway, why? The reason is very simple. God is very intentional about marriage. I mean, he is the one that invented it, right? We go to Genesis, and what does the Bible say? So this is Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26. It goes through 31, and it says the following. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, 
over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. And I want you to notice here something very interesting. Is the contrast or, or the, the play on, on words between a single word and a plural word. He says, let us, this is God talking, the Trinity. He says, let us make men, single, right? In our image. And then he says, let them have dominion. From the very beginning, one of the things that comes across very clear in the Bible was the unity that this man and woman were supposed to have. It's amazing. It's really amazing. Uh, it goes on to say, uh, well, let me see the last part right there. And see, uh, so God created man in his own image. Next verse says, in the image of God, he created them. He created him. Male and female, he created them. Do you see that? It is intentional. It's that unity that was supposed to be there. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the earth, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God saw everything that he had made. And indeed, it was how? It was what? It says good, right? So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So in the sixth day, God not only created all the living creatures, not only did he create Adam and Eve, but he started that wonderful thing that today we know as marriage. And so he is one of the biggest proponents of marriage, one of the biggest supporters of marriage. And if he created this world, cannot he create a wonderful marriage in your life? And the answer is yes. He is able if we let him have his place in our lives. The first home was intentional. In forming the first family, he established the basic social unity for humanity, giving them a sense of belonging and providing them with an opportunity to develop as well-rounded persons in service to God and others. This is God's intention. He was intentional about that. And we see it all over the scripture. It goes from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation. We find passage after passage that supports the plan of God and the plan that he had for the family. We find it in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2. In fact, in chapter 3, we see the consequences of sin and how it is it, it started to divide that first couple. Uh, I don't have time to get into that this morning, but Exodus 25, 8, Jeremiah 31, and many Proverbs and Psalms tells us about how God wants to be part of this union. And so that's why it's so important that God becomes number one in our relationship with them. Notice this from Patriarchs and Prophets. It says, God celebrated the first marriage. It was one of the first gifts of God to man. Do you see that? It was one of the first gifts. Um, it says, and it is one of the two institutions that after the fall, Adam brought with him beyond the gates of paradise. When the divine principles are recognized. And I, I highlighted that. I put it on, on blue letters because it does reminds us that there are divine principles. And this divine principle we find in the scripture. He says, when they are recognized and obey in this relationship, marriage is a blessing. It guards the purity and happiness of the race. It provides for man's social needs. It elevates the physical, intellectual, and moral nature. And I say, amen. Because God indeed has a plan for marriage. And he has divine principles that we can find and end up in the Bible. And if we follow them, we'll be blessed. Something like, for instance, we can see in John chapter 10, verses 10, chapter 10, verse 10, where it tells us that God is the one that brings happiness to our lives. Amen. Notice what it says. It says, the enemy, the thieves does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Whenever a family is following the advice of the enemy, which comes through the media, it comes through what you see on Facebook or what you see on your movies or your entertainment, which comes sometimes through friends that want to discourage you. When you are listening to that, you're listening to the voice of the enemy. But then Jesus says, I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. And you think about this, when, when a couple listens to God, when God is in the midst of the relationship, when he is the center of the relationship, he brings them together. And he says there's more life and it's more abundant. Uh, it, it is amazing. There's a beautiful passage that talks about this in Philippians chapter 2. 
And I would encourage you, this one, everyone married and with relationships here present, I will encourage you to look it up, find it in your Bible and highlight it, and then think about how you can apply this to your relationships. Remember, this is not just about marriage. This is about relationships. But notice what it says. So this is Philippians chapter 2, it's starting in verse 1. It says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection of mercy, affection and mercy, he's talking to those that have God's Spirit in their lives. Okay? That's very clear right there. If you have all these things in your life, if you have Jesus in your heart, if the Holy Spirit is working in your life, if God is at the center of your heart, okay? What happens? He says, Feel my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. This is only possible in Jesus Christ, when He is in our hearts. Then He says in verse 3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than what? Better than himself, better than himself, herself. God is asking us that when in our relationships, in our loving relationship with others, we need to think of others first. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Because what I've learned is that in relationships, when you put yourself first, you don't find joy, happiness, and excitement in the relationship. But when you put others first, that relationship changes. And relationships change. I remember I had a, 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 an older man in my congregation. He was, he was uh, coming to the end of his life. And he was an amazing person. I mean, that guy talked to everyone he found. He always carried tracks. He would lift tracks everywhere he went. I mean, he was, was just an amazing person. And he came to the, to the end of his life. He passed away. And we had a funeral. And that funeral, by the way, this one was very, very humble. He lived in a tiny little efficiency apartment. That's where he lived. I later found out that it wasn't because he didn't have money. He just didn't want to spend money in the wrong things. And he spent money on his friends and family and relationships. When we had that funeral, that church was packed. Packed, 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 packed. I mean, there was no room for anyone else. Not long after, there was someone else that passed away. But someone that had made a fortune and had a big house and a big mansion. And that place was empty when we had the funeral. And you think about it. What makes the difference between the two pictures that I just presented you? And it's the relationships. When you're focused on others, it makes a power of difference. And the same happens in our relationships. So he says, let each of you... So he says, esteem others better than yourself. He says... Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And then it gets to verse 5, which is one that you know by heart. It says, let the mind be, this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And what was the mind of Christ? It is the idea that Jesus left everything behind for us. He became a servant so we can have eternal life. Isn't that awesome? And he's asking us to have the mind of Jesus. Do you have that mind in your relationships? Are others more important than yourself? Are you loving others and putting them in first place? Especially those that are closer to you, that are more important in your life? And if the answer is no, I want to encourage you to think about it. Um, I'm going to skip this one because it's an awesome passage, but I want to go ahead and go to 1 Corinthians 13. Because I love this passage. This talks about perfect love. And it's used in so many wed weddings, even though it doesn't have to do with weddings. Did you know that? The context of this chapter and the context of this passage is actually the gifts of the Spirit. So if, if it is the gift of the Spirit, and it is the Holy Spirit that gives us this gift, can I have this gift? No. Do you think I can have this gift? Do you think that you can have this gift? And the answer is what? Yes. yes. Is a solid yes. Meaning that love in its best manifestation, the best love that you can think of, comes from where? Who gives it to you? God is the one. And that's why God is such an important part of the marriage relationship. And again, of any other relationship. So what does it say? So this is 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4. And it says the following. You probably heard it many times. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. 
does not behave rudely, does not seek his own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, holds all things, endures all things. I love that last part. I'm going to read it again. It says, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then it finishes, or that verse that I have, the quotation I have right there, says, love never what? What? Love never fails. Awesome, right? Challenging, isn't it? Especially if you're having trouble with those that you love. Especially when you think in the context of sometimes marriage where it is, is difficult. And the answer is, how do you do it? What do you do? How do you solve that? And the answer is, love that comes from God. Isn't that amazing? I love this one. It's, this one is from Ministry of Healing. And it says, Though difficulties, perplexes, and discouragement may arise, let neither husband nor wife harbor the thought that their union is a mistake or disappointment. Did you hear that one? Don't think that it was a mistake. Because what? God can fix it. But no, not only that. He says, um, Determined. Determined, it says. Determined to be all that is possible to be each, to each other. Continue the early attentions. In every way, encourage each other in fighting the battles of life. And study to advance the happiness of each other. Let there be mutual love, mutual forbearance. Then marriage, instead of being the end of love, will be, as it were, the very beginning of love. Oh, I love that part. It says, the warmth of true friendship, the love that binds heart to heart, is a foretaste of the joys of heaven. But it does talk about intentionality. It says, determine. It says, encourage. It says, study. It says, let there be. All these are words that talk about intentionality. So, here comes the quiz. Don't answer aloud. I don't want any of you to get in trouble. But I want you to think about this. What is the current level, level of is spiritual intentionality within your marriage? If we were going to put it on now, you know, 1 to 10 scale, will it be a 10? Will it be a 5? Will it be a 1? And remember, we're applying this to relationships in general. So how is this also in the context of your relationship with your children? If they're grown and left, the, the, you have the emptiness. What if you're by yourself and you have other relationships? My friends, it's so important. For God to be the center of all our relationships. Brothers, sisters, siblings. My friends, it is so important. Next one. It says, reflect on how important it is to give God a prominent place in your marriage. Think about it. All right. This is, if I can say this, it's kind of for you to take home and think about these questions. It's, in fact, if you want, take a picture of it so you can do it with your spouse later on. That way you can, you can practice this later. And then the last one says, think of ways how you can take your marriage relationship with God to the next level. Because when you do that, it's going to influence your marriage and it's going to make it better. Okay? So that was what number of intentionality was that? That was number one. And this is the most important one. And that's why I put it number one. I talk about it first because it's the one that is going to make a huge difference in your marriage relationship. And by the way, remember, if you are having a great marriage, praise the Lord. But you can do better. And if you're struggling, well, praise God, you can actually do better. My friends, it's possible with Jesus on our side. The journey to the family of your dreams. But we're talking about marriage. So I'm going to put their marriage. The journey to the marriage of your dreams never starts tomorrow. When does it start? Today, right? Today you make those decisions. And you are going to be intentional about the way you're going to relate to your spouse. So the next one is setting boundaries. Intentional, clear, and defined boundaries for your marriage is extremely important. And these boundaries are things that you need to have clarity on. Because that's what a boundary is. It's something that clearly tells you, you don't go past this point. And I think this is where many of our marriages fail. is because we don't have those boundaries. 
And I have a couple of them. For instance, opposite sex relationships. The friendship with someone that is, is not your spouse, either uh, an old girlfriend or an old boyfriend. Now, I'm not talking about a necessarily romantic relationship, but just someone of the opposite sex that is inter, um, interjecting themselves in your relationship with your spouse and getting in the way. Intimate relationships outside your marriage, kind of the same thing also. Images or word images and secrets. Those are very, very important. But there are other ones that also need to be considered. For instance, abuse in any of its forms. My friends, abuse of any of its forms is a boundary that should, should never be crossed. It should be put there, there in your marriage and never allowed to come in. And when it does, I want to encourage you to seek help. Seek help because it's not good for marriage to have any form of abuse. Outsiders in the home or in the marriage. My friends, a marriage needs to be, the Bible says this several times. In Genesis, Jesus Christ repeated it. He said, let them move out. Let them do their own thing. Let them form their own house together. So it's important that there will be no outsiders in the marriage. Um, uh, social events, sharing intimate stories outside of your marriage circle. Addictions that can really hook you and interfere in your relationship. So those things are boundaries that are very important to keep away from your relationship. And then give your marriage the right amount of time in the form of dating, in the form of loving, and in the more form of having fun. I, um, I've said this to many couples, and it's amazing how I asked this very simple question. I said, all right, guys, I have a man and a woman in front of me. They've been married for some time. I say, when was the last time you had fun? And very often, they will look at each other and they cannot remember the last time they had fun. Isn't that something? That means that they have gotten into a rut, whether there's work, church, whatever other things are getting in the way, and they're just not spending time with each other. They, they, they have not tickled each other for a long time. So it's important that we have, that we make sure that our marriage has time. And that we're investing time in our marriage. And so if you're married, my friends, keep dating. It didn't stop when you got married, all right? Keep dating. And, and just to point a prominent figure that has done this for many years. And, and uh, I don't know if he's still doing it, but when I read it, he was the president of the United States. And that was uh, President Obama. And even as a president, he had a weekly date with his wife. And I was like, whoa, praise the Lord. I'm not talking here about Democrats or Republicans, all right? Don't get mad at me or don't get happy with me. I'm just saying that president took time every week for a date with his wife. And that's what we should do. We should take time often to spend it with our loved ones. Remember, we're talking about applying these principles to other relationships too. This is a great question. You see it right there, right? Is your child... Are your children more important than your marriage? So I'm not going to ask you for a question right here in front of everybody. But very often I hear someone say, yes, they are. They are our future. We need to invest everything we can in our children. And because of that, yes, they're number one. My friends, what happens if you focus all your time on your children and by the time they get to a certain age, that person that you were raising them with is a stranger? Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So children, is they shouldn't be number one. Neither should be your job. Neither should be your church. And the pastor doesn't get mad at me, I hope. Neither should be your friends. Neither should be anything else that takes the time of your relationship. Facebook, TV, other distractions, all that takes away from your marriage relationship. And it's a something that will divide and will uh, make you become a stranger. So you need to invest time in your relationships. So here comes a couple of other questions. What is impeding? What's getting in your way for you to give your marriage a higher priority? Very important. You need to give your, ma your marriage time and priority. How are you applying this to your boundaries, to your time, and to your life as a couple? Are you investing time in your marriage? So I hope that you are. I want to finish with this part. So I read this article a few, few uh, little while ago, it's, it's in Church Leaders, and it says 12 habits that lead, lead to divorce. And I thought, well, yeah, there are 12 habits that lead to divorce. 
What would be the opposite to that? So what I'm doing is I'm going to show you a list of 12 things that can lead to divorce and 12 things you can do to avoid divorce. Okay, let's see how this comes out. All right, number one, constant criticism. Remember what I said about applying this to all relationships? What happens if your children grow up and they're always criticized? What happens if your friends are always hearing from you criticism, right? Okay, so you see the point I'm trying to make. It applies to all relationships. But instead of looking for faults, I would encourage you, in fact, uh, uh, to all of you, I want to give you the challenge that this week, and those relationships that are closest to you, I want to encourage you to look for value. What does that mean? You're going to tell your wife every day, hey, honey, you're so valuable to me. You do this, this every day. I never say thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. And for the husband to say, I'm sorry, for the wife to say, husband, honey, whatever you call them, hey, I'm going to tell you today that, wow, when you do this, you make me feel so, so loved. You, you are so valuable in this house. Tell your children that. Tell your parents that. I mean, it's going to revolutionize your relationship. Number two, dividing everything into his and hers. Now, this one is great for the kids. So, children, now you're listening to me. <laughs> so my question is, are all your toys yours only and you can share with anyone? No, right, thank you. You are like, no, no, thank you so much, guys. We need to learn to share. But that happens even more important when you are a grown-up and you have other relationships. So instead of finding and dividing things into yours and mine, we need to find things that we have in common and then make those things bring us together. All right? Number three, putting the marriage on hold while we, you know, and I've heard people say, I'm going to put my marriage on hold while I do this or that. And my friends, that is just a window, a door that you're opening for a breakup. Instead of going apart to work on issues, then come together to work on issues. So work on solutions while staying together. That will make your marriage stronger. Giving each other the leftovers. Yeah, don't just give your wife, your husband, your children, just what is left over of your time, of your life, of your gifts. But make each other, number one, making a priority, just like it said, an efficiency. And that's very important. Number five, holding grudges and keeping scores. One of the biggest problems in relationships sometimes is the memory that the other person has, right? You make a mistake and they're like, 20 years ago, you did the same thing. And then remember 10 years ago when you did this and this and this. And they have an incredible memory when it comes to those things. We have to leave that behind. We have to start to forgive and forget. Now people are going to say, well, pastor, that's very difficult. Yes, it's very difficult for you to do it. That's why you need God in your relationship. So God can help you overcome those things. And stop bringing it up. It doesn't help anything. So be more positive. Again, forgive, forgive, and move forward. Number six, trusting your feelings more than your commitments. Base your relationship on your commitment and your promises. You promise more, more likely, most of you, if you get married in the church or by a pastor or in a religious setting, more likely you said that you promise before God and those witnesses that you will do a number of things. Well, you made that promise. Stick with it. It will make a difference. Don't go based on your feelings because your feelings will change. Don't let your feelings change. I mean, I got, go to bed in the, mo in the evening and I'm like, tomorrow morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to run and I'm just going to have this kind of breakfast that is extremely healthy. And then I wake up in the morning and I don't want to run. And I just want the old fattened stuff, you know, <laughs> comfort food, right? And it's probably what I go with. But is that the best thing? I'm not talking about food right now. I'm talking about marriage. You know, going by your feelings, your feelings will change. Right? But your commitment should never change. So stick with your commitment. No, don't go by the feelings. Making decisions without consulting your spouse. This is a big one. And we guys are more famous for that. We guys have the tendency to make decisions. And then, you know, and then we come up with that thing that says, well, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission, right? 
And then we get in bigger trouble, right, guys? I mean, are you with me here? <laughs> so what we need to do is focus on communication. Communication, sharing things, thoughts, plans, ideas. Uh, uh, so talk about individual uh, activities that you're doing, bring them together, and make the decisions together. Trying to change each other. This is a big one. I've heard so many times uh, individuals, when they're single and they're dating and they're getting into the serious part of the relationship and they say, well, don't worry. When we get married, mm, I'll change her. I'll change him. That does not work. Do, do you agree with me? That doesn't work, right? <laughs> so what you need to do is embrace the person as they are and work with what you have. Always in a positive way. Number nine, planning and exit the strategy is the individual that says, I get married. If it doesn't work, then I get a divorce. When you get married with that idea, or if in your mind you're thinking, eh, you know, if it doesn't work, it is an exit. And that doesn't work in any relationship. Do you, would you have any close friends if all your friends felt that way about you? Come on, you know you're difficult sometimes, right? <laughs> So what will happen? No. So we need to actually have, never have an easy way out. If you have something to discuss, discuss it. If you have something hard to talk about, go ahead and do it. But it will make your relationship better. Number 10, hiding the fact that you are married. Hiding the fact that you are married is a big one. And very often, couples may do that. They just want to tell everybody that maybe because of their job, maybe if they're flirtatious, they get to sell more stuff. But that doesn't help. And it actually creates more problems. So intentionally proclaim your status. Intentionally talk about your wife or your husband. Intentionally bring it up so people know that you are in a committed relationship, right? And that you're committed to that relationship. Number 11, see porn, erotica, graphic novels, as harmless entertainment because it is not. Keep your eyes, your hearts, your touch, and your mind as pure as possible. And what that means, my friends, is that you're going to have to eliminate things in your life that are leading you to that. Entertainment usually is most, most often. Um, uh, well, why don't go down the list? You know what you're struggling with. So you have to be careful to keep those things out of your life. Because remember what David told God with, after his adultery. Do you remember what he said? He said, against you I have sinned. First relationship that is broken is the one with God. And then it goes down the rain, all the others. So keep your eyes, your hearts, your touch, and your mind pure as possible. And then number 12, selfishness. And this, my friends, I feel people say, what is... What are the reasons that for divorce and marriage? What are the most often? And people talk about money, you know, talk communication. They talk about several things. To me, this is the number one. Because very often what I hear individuals say is, I am not finding happiness in this relationship. And because of that, they're ready to toss it out and go and start a new one. And what happens is the new one ends up the same way. Because as long as it is about you, you're never going to be happy. This is a rule of life, actually. When your focus is in your own happiness, your own satisfaction, your own getting your way, you always are going to have trouble in your relationships. But when you're focused on others, your life and your relationship will be different. And that's why I go back to Philippians. Philippians where it says, esteem others higher than yourself. Put others first in your relationships and it will change the way your marriage is and your relationships are uh, going on in your life. So with intentionality, it's possible to have a great marriage. Does that make sense? And I want to finish with this one. It's first, um, it's, it's a text that many of us know by heart. Philippians 4.13. Jesus Christ said it different when he talked about this in John 15. He said, without me, you can do how much? Did he say he said nothing, right? But Paul, uh, Peter, I'm sorry, Paul here gives it a spin and he puts it in the other perspective. He says, I can do all things. Is that it? Do we stop there? No, right? True Christ. Because true Christ, when you come face to face with Jesus, your life is transformed. 
When you are confronted with Jesus Christ, your life is, ends as it was, and now you have a new focus in your life. And that is to put God number one in your life, and that is to put God number one in your relationships. And as you do that, your heart becomes changed, and that selfish focus changes because now your heart belongs to Jesus. And so if you're still focusing on yourself, I want to propose to you, my friends, that you need to be a little more surrendered to Jesus. Because it's hard to say that I love Jesus with all my heart, but i still number one in my life. Do you hear that? It's hard to say I love Jesus with all my heart, but I is still I am number one in my life. Can't be that way. Surrender to Christ means putting him first and then putting those that we love also first. And it makes a powerful difference. A reminder of his story. It's a true story. The pastor in the story told me this event. So he was doing a marriage enrichment event. It was a weekend. People got there on Friday evening. Friday evening, they spent the weekend there. He had several activities throughout the weekend. And Sunday, everybody goes home. And so he had done several times. He had uh, different activities that he was doing. And as one of the activities, when couples were coming, he was with his wife at the door, welcoming all the couples, giving them instructions, where to go, you know, all the things they had to do. And, um, and uh, so as this couple is entering the room, uh, they were coming a little late, probably one of the last ones to show up. The woman shakes his hand. As she shakes his hand, drops him a little closer and says, Pastor, I'm here because all my friends said that I had to come here before doing what I'm going to do next. And Monday, I'm going to get filed papers for a divorce. That's, that was her plan. But she came because all her friends said that she had to come. And of course, that was her husband, and he was behind, and he was looking down, and pastor just, how do you answer that? I mean, how do you say, well, welcome, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> I mean, he just smiled and said, well, I, I hope that, that you have a good weekend. I hope that you get something out of this. And so she went in and got settled in the room. And, and so anyway, they come to the first meeting. And the first meeting went, went through fine. At the end of the meeting, remember, it's Friday evening. Everybody's going to their rooms. It's, it's Sabbath. So he encouraged the couples to have time praying together. And he said, as you pray, ask God this question. Now, he, talked to, he told this everybody. He said, as you pray tonight, pray with each other before you go to sleep. And pray with each other and say, Lord... What is it that you want me to surrender in my life to you in my relationship? What is it that I need to give you to take charge of? That was it. Everybody went to their cabins, their rooms. And, and anyway, night goes on. Next day, morning, morning, pastors again. They're welcoming everyone as they're coming for breakfast. And here she comes marching down. Really upset. Pastor sees her coming. He's like, oh boy, what, what happened here? <laughs> And here comes, her husband is right behind her, just walking, looking down, you know. And she says, Pastor, I want to ask you something. Were you praying for me last night? And he says, well, I was praying for everybody. <laughs> I wasn't praying for you specifically, but I was praying for everybody. She says, he says, what, what happened? And she says, well, Pastor, we couldn't fall asleep. We did not pray together before going to bed like you told us to. I just didn't want to pray with them. But about three in the morning, she says, I turned to him and said, I can't sleep. I'm turning and tossing. And are you asleep? He says, no, I can't sleep. He says, I can't stop thinking about the pastor and what he said that we had to do before going to sleep. He says, yeah, me too. He says, the husband says, he says, well, you think we should do it? He says, well, let's try. And they prayed together. And as they were praying, she said, Lord, what do I need to do? She says that her heart broke and they cried together. And she says, just because before coming here for breakfast, I called my lawyer and canceled the appointment that I have for Monday. My friends, God is the number one in our lives. Should be the first thing that we think about and should be the center of all our relationships. This morning, I want to pray for you. If you're married and you are here with your spouse, I would encourage you to hold hands. If you're here with your kids, hold hands with your kids too. Because you know, he's the center of our families too. And if you're here by yourself, 
and you have a significant person in your life, then, then just go like this, like you're holding his or her hand or whoever's hand you're holding, because symbolically we're going to pray for you and that relationship. And even if you're single and have no one in your life, I still want you to do this because I want you to be holding Jesus' hand as we pray. Is that okay? All right. So let's pray together. You don't have to stand. All I'm asking you to do is to hold hands if you're together as a family. Or if someone is important in your life, then you hold hands symbolically. Or then you just hold hands with Jesus. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for everyone that is present here this afternoon. And Lord, as sinful creatures that we are and we every one of us is we all make mistakes we all have selfish tendencies we all want to do things to please ourselves to make ourselves happy to make and and sometimes we ask that others make us happy but father you are the only one that can make us happy so this morning as our families here are holding hands husbands and wives or symbolically if the spouse is not here lord or as I mentioned, um, holding your hand, I pray, Lord, that this morning, each one of us will surrender our hearts to you. That's the number one thing, Father. That if we have never given our lives to you, that this morning we'll, we'll surrender our hearts to you. If someone is watching at home and they, they might be sitting in the chair, in the sofa, or ready to eat, or maybe still in bed, it doesn't matter, Lord. But whatever we are this morning as we're listening to this, that we are surrendering our lives before you. And as we're holding hands with those that we love, or as we're holding a hand thinking of those that we love, Lord, that we will surrender those relationships before you too. So then you can be the number one thing in our lives, the one that is going to bring us together and transform our relationships. And Father, let this day today be the day where a new family life starts, where a new marriage relationship starts, where a new son and, and parents and daughter and parents relationship starts, where we start to see our friends and our siblings and our loved ones differently because we see them through your eyes. And the eyes of Jesus see the great love and purity that you have in each one of us. So pray, I, I pray, Father, as we do that, as we surrender our hearts to you, that you will come in and your Holy Spirit will make this transformation in our lives. And I thank you because I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Let's all stand for our closing song this morning, The Blessing.
in his favor Be upon you in a thousand generations And your family and your children And your children and your children May his presence go before you And behind you and beside you All around you and within you He is with you Praise God. Our Lord, we're so grateful for your goodness. We thank you for the opportunity of being together, Father, this morning and worshiping you. Whether we're here in person or through our virtual connections, we are one in Christ. Keep us one, Lord. Make our families one. Make our church one. And Lord, come soon because we want to be with you for eternity and rejoice with you and experience the worship of heaven being in your presence. But for now, as we go our different ways, as we go to our different homes, Lord, go with us and continue to bless us. Be our God. We invite you. We thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.